Hello, welcome. What a fantastic turnout on a wet Wednesday evening. Wonderful that you've all turned up. And let me also extend a warm welcome to those of you tuning in live from Geelong's Deakin University and Ballarat University. A hello to you, special hello to you. And a hello to viewers of ABC's Big Ideas as well. We are filming for the ABC's Big Ideas program tonight, just to let you know that. Now, tonight is all about the technology, except for one piece of technology in your pockets, in your bags, if you could turn off that piece of technology that we're all so addicted to or put it on silent, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Now, the Graham Clark Oration honours the pioneering work of one of Australia's scientists, uh, greatest scientist, greatest living scientist, Professor Graham Clark, based here in Melbourne. He is the visionary behind the world's first bionic ear or multi-channel cochlear implant, which now over 200,000 people worldwide have the benefit of. It helps them hear. And with that, Graham Clark really put Australia on the map. We're almost as famous for the cochlear implant as we are for that salty, yeasty, black paste that we spread on our bread every morning. And, and I, I think if anyone saw the footage last night of Obama, President Obama, he disagrees. Um, Professor Clark has put us on the map for another reason too, for the way he approached the invention of the bionic ear. He's been a real bridge builder. If you think about the bionic ear and all that's involved in developing a piece of technology that connects an individual brain to the wider sensory world. Just imagine, there's engineering, there's materials, there's electronics, there's biology, there's neuroscience, there's medicine, there's surgery, and, and I would argue there's also sociology as well. And early on, Graham really saw the need for a large multidisciplinary team in the development of the bionic ear. This was absolutely key to his innovation. And that's very much what tonight's oration is about. It's hosted by ICT for Life Sciences Forum. That's ICT, Information, Communication, Technology and the Life Sciences coming together tonight uh, at this event. And if ever there was a domain that's called for a partnership, uh, a convergence, if you like, between biology, computing, engineering, it's certainly the domain of the brain, my favourite organ. Um, if we think about the brain and all that it does, it thinks, it's at the heart of everything we do as humans. Uh, and if we could build the brain's remarkable intelligence, unique sort of intelligence into computer programs, into machines, into robotics, who knows what we might achieve. And what about if we blend our own intelligence with machine intelligence? Uh, I'm thinking, last week I was in Washington, I can see Wilson de Silva's here tonight, he was over there as well. And I sat down with an Iraqi war veteran, uh, an Iraq soldier, um, an American soldier who served in Iraq. His arm had been amputated. He lost his arm in combat in Iraq. And he was a man who had a bionic arm strapped to his body which he controlled through thought alone. And sitting down with him and doing an interview with him and getting him to demonstrate this process of him having a thought and it translating into a machine movement was staggering. And if we could re reverse engineer or model the workings of the brain, so the other way around, using computers, that has all sorts of potential too, in understanding what goes right with the brain and what goes wrong with the brain. Alzheimer's, um, autism, just some of the uh, interests, research interests of our orator tonight. Like Graham Clark, our speaker this year is a wonderful polymath. He's based at one of the world's most brilliant scientific institutions, the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in San Diego, an incredible institution. Professor Terence Sanofsky heads up the computational neurobiology uh, laboratory there. He holds the Francis Crick chair at the Salk. He did his PhD in physics at Princeton. Uh, he did his postdoc at Harvard Medical School, the great makings of a polymath already there, you can see. He's also an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and professor of biology at the University of California, San Diego, where he co-directs 
uh, two outfits, the Institute for Neural Computation uh, and also the NSF Temporal Dynamics of Learning Centre, which I'm sure we'll hear more about tonight. He is the president of the Neural Information Processing Systems Foundation and founding editor-in-chief of the journal Neural Computation. Terry, when do you sleep? I can't imagine. You don't. You're a miracle. You are a machine. Um, he's a true pioneer in his field of neural networks, as you'll hear, in modelling how things like memory work in the brain and the vast networks of brain cells that make it possible. He's published an enormous number of papers. I'm interested uh, in his book that he wrote with the wonderful neurophilosopher Pat Churchland, The Computational Brain. And amongst his many honours, Terry was elected to the Institute of Medicine in 2008 and the US Academy of Sciences last year. We're really delighted to have you here to deliver the 2011 Graham Clark Oration on the subject of the computational brain. Let's give him a warm welcome. So thank you very much for that uh, very generous introduction and thank you all for coming. I'm especially honored to be here because Graham Clark is one of my personal heroes. I think his accomplishment is something that is, is going to have a huge impact, uh, not just as you'll see in my talk on the bionic ear, but on uh, prostheses, for other sensory systems, and also for uh, really enhancing uh, what it is that uh, nature has provided us, which is the most complex device in the known universe, our brains. Now, my wife, who's a scientist and physician who is here, uh, tells me that, Terry, it's not quite true. You know, the brain is just a part of your body. And the body is so complex that it has to really be taken into account. The brain does not work without the body. And, and I think that's what's, uh, where the future is heading. And that will, I'll get to that uh, toward the end of my talk. So I want to start with a conundrum. This is a honeybee, uh, Apis mellifera. And this little creature is one of the smartest insects on the planet. The honeybee can forage for food over many kilometers, which would be the equivalent of going from here up to Sydney uh, relative to its size. Uh, it can distinguish between different flowers, the, the relative uh, benefits of flowers, and it can learn the, the color of the flower associated with the reward the shape and, and the uh, odor of the flower. Uh, it can take that information back to the hive. It can, uh, using a waggle dance, uh, tell other workers where it's located, where, where they can go and get this uh, wonderful nectar. And finally, uh, these bees maintain colonies, they uh, reproduce, and they do it all with a brain that has about a million neurons, compared to your brains that have uh, over 100 billion neurons. So that's a tremendously, it's a really uh, an incredibly small brain, but it looked at all the things it can do. I want to compare this with the world's fastest supercomputer, which right now is the, the title is held by a computer in China that is capable of over two petaflops. And, and that's a, a very big number, 10 to the 15, uh, so that's uh, a million billion floating point operations per second. Now just the power to keep that going uh, requires about four megawatts, a small power plant. And this, the power bill is uh, millions of dollars a year just for the power. Now it costs about a hundred million dollars, but that's not the real true cost. The true cost is all of the money that goes into paying for the programmers who have to feed it. Constant programs, right? Now that supercomputer cannot see as well as the bee. It can't fly as well as the bee. And as far as I know, none of these supercomputers has ever reproduced. What's wrong here? There seems to be a disconnect between what nature can do and what we can do. There are some principles that we should be able to understand 
and if we could understand them, we could reverse engineer those principles and create devices that had some of the cognitive capabilities that uh, some of our uh, fellow creatures have. So let's, uh, this takes us to um, artificial intelligence. It was one of the first efforts to try to mechanize thought. Uh, this is, uh, goes back to the 1950s when the first digital computers became available. And digital computers are really good at things like arithmetic, uh, much better than we are. Uh, they could be programmed to play games like chess. In fact, uh, IBM has shown that uh, if you have a big enough computer that has fast enough, uh, you can even compete with the world's best humans. And finally, uh, theorem proving, right? So you can prove it to do deductive logic. Now, when the early uh, pioneers in artificial intelligence saw this, they thought for sure that the intelligent computer would be right around the corner. Well, here we are, it's more than 50 years later, and we've discovered a whole list of failures. Uh, it's been very difficult to understand how we see, to program a computer to see as well as we do. Uh, to move around like a, a robot. Uh, our robots are still very clunky. And finally, this is the thing that really surprised everybody, was that common sense, which is something that we take for granted, all these things we take for granted, turn out to be things that are incredibly difficult to program in terms of logic. And therein lies, I think, the problem. The problem is that it's not by logic alone that we are able to accomplish what we have. What's wrong with this picture? Well, let's go back to the 19th century, and uh, George Bull was one of the pioneers. He invented Boolean logic, and here is his treatise, and what's it about? It's about the laws of thought, and it's an investigation of the laws of thought on which are founded the mathematical theories of logic and probabilities. Now, that's an interesting word. Why would he use probabilities, right? Uh, if, if he's a founder of Boolean logic, well, if you go to his book, Half of it is all about trying to understand how uncertainties can be taken into account. And not through deductive logic, but rather through inductive logic. How do you go from examples to generality? You have to make a leap of faith, and you do that with probabilities. And uh, this is a branch of mathematics that's very well developed, going back to the French mathematicians who studied games of chance. And this turns out to be where nature really it has to be uh, taken into account all of the possibilities that happen to you every day, all of the things that you could not have anticipated, uh, people that you were going to meet that you've never met before, languages, perhaps uh, different accents, as I've noticed. Uh, and how could that be programmed? Well, uh, <clears throat> Natasha mentioned the uh, Neural Information Processing Systems uh, meeting that takes place every year. Uh, this last year in Vancouver, we had 1,300 participants, and they come from all parts of science, mathematics, engineering, medicine, uh, vision, speech recognition. And these are all problems that involve very large, complex data sets. Uh, if you want to understand something about vision, you, there, there's you can go on the internet now and literally get hundreds of millions of pictures. And now that we have this, these huge databases, we need to be able to come up with the mathematics to deal with it. And it turns out to be probabilities. It turns out to be taking into account all of the different variations that we see in the world and trying to distill them down into not a set of rules, logical rules, but rather a set of probabilities that allow us to make good guesses. So this now <clears throat> takes us back to a more fundamental question, a philosophical question. What is a computer? We are so dominated by digital computers that it's become synonymous with computers. But what did people do to compute before they had digital computers? And that was about 1950 or so, when the first digital computers were first uh, uh, built. Well, when I went to college, I used to compute with a slide rule. And this is a, a giant slide rule that sits in my office. It's an analog computer. It, two blocks of wood that slide back and forth. And with it, you can multiply and divide, take logarithms. Uh, students don't know what this is anymore. They think it's some kind of an artifact. 
uh, but in fact, uh, this was a, uh, a, a centerpiece in a chapter that Pat Churchland and I wrote when we looked at this from the perspective of, you know, what does it mean to compute? How are there are many, many ways that uh, nature could be using to solve problems that for us involves writing a program, but could be solved through the actual physics of the materials themselves. And let me give you an example of that. This is a computer that you could build out of strings. So here's, here's the problem. The problem is uh, I want to drive from Seattle to Miami, and I want to take the shortest route. And I have all the cities and the distances between the cities. And one way to do that is to go through all possible combinations of cities and make a long list. And this is what you do if you're writing a computer program. The computer would just go through and exhaustively search all possible routes, and then it would pick the, the shortest route. But it's a lot of steps. But here's a way that you could solve that problem in one step. What you do is you it takes a little bit of effort. You get this ball of string. And you take uh, the string and cut it into pieces whose length was proportional to the distance between the cities. And you connect it up in little knots like a doily. Okay? Does it, everybody know what a doily is? Okay, it's a little string thing that you put on your tables. Okay. So just imagine now you're going to pick up this little string doily by the corners here in Seattle and here in Miami. So here's Seattle and here's Miami. And you pull it taut. And now, in order to find the shortest route, you just look at the cities, the knots, along the top. Because that's the shortest route, the one that's the tautest. Now, not only can I solve the problem of how to go from Seattle to Miami in the shortest distance, but I can solve that problem for any pair of cities. If I want to find the distance between San Diego down here and Boston up here, I just pick it up by those two knots and pull it taut. What well, this illustrates, this is a, a computer, a special purpose computer. It can solve one problem, and it solves it really fast and really well. And I'd like to use this as a metaphor for what nature has created in our brains. We have special purpose computers. It's not a single computer, it's hundreds of computers. Each of them specialized for one, with the job that they have, and they do it exceedingly well. The equivalent of sitting down and putting together all the strings together in a, a little uh, doily is what happens when you, uh, to you when you went to school. What was going on in your brain when you were sitting in the classroom and you were learning about geography, history, mathematics? You were creating neural circuits that had very, very, very uh, uh, strong connections between different parts of your brain that were able to do these computations very rapidly and very efficiently. And now, as an expert in whatever area you're working, you can solve a problem by just looking at it and saying, gee, you know, I think I know how to solve that problem. And because of your expert knowledge, because of the fact that you can navigate all these different, uh, uh, different routes in your brain, uh, you can, you can uh, uh, bring that to bear in just a few steps. And that's what a chess master does when they look at a board. They're not going through all possible moves. You couldn't possibly do that. But they could immediately tell you which is the most likely move to make. And of course, they check it out. But they don't have to check all moves, just the ones that are the most probable to be the best moves. OK, now that takes us down to the actual machinery. So let's take a look what's inside the brain. The brain is made of these neurons, 100 billion in your brain. And they are, they are very numerous, but they're very slow compared to a digital computer. So it, it takes, for example, um, many milliseconds for a signal that uh, come, it starts here at this one neuron to travel down the axon and then connect up to the dendrites of the other neurons. Um, you know, millisecond, in a millisecond, a digital computer can do millions of computations. It's, it's really uh, orders of magnitude faster. Now, where the brain really shines, though, is the fact that it can do all these computations in parallel. And, and that's really the, the secret, is how is it that you can take a problem and create a network of connections between neurons that will allow it to solve some difficult problem that you might not even be able to describe in words. I'm going to give you some examples. 
Here's one of the very first neural networks that I worked on uh, when I was uh, just starting my career. Uh, it was a time when, like, like I said, uh, the rule-based uh, digital computers were uh, becoming faster. But it looked as if uh, it, it would be very difficult to take on a problem like English pronunciation. Now, why is English such a difficult language? It's because it's so irregular. A single letter can be pronounced in a dozen different ways, right? All the different pronunciations of the letter A, for example. Or a C could be a hard C in cat or a soft C in city. And how do you know what the right pronunciation is? Well, you've experienced these words over and over again. And furthermore, even if you came across a word you'd never seen before, you could use phonics to help you guide you through what, to what the most probable pronunciation is. So here's the, the network that we developed uh, with Charlie Rosenberg back in the 1980s. Uh, we started out by having uh, three layers of these very simple model neurons, and these are very s simple compared to real neurons. Uh, each of these model neurons uh, was, had a connection to each of the hidden units here, 80 hidden units, and then each of these in turn had connections to the output units, and the output units represented the different sounds, the different uh, 40 or 50 odd sounds of the English language. And the goal of the network was to take the center letter in a string of letters and to pronounce the middle one. Now, the connection strengths between the units, when we first started, of course, were started out with small random numbers, and they had to be trained by experience. Just the same way that you pick up the sounds, for example, that go with the letters. You first have to experience them. And so, for example, the network at the first time through might give you a, 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 the wrong sound, but the teacher gives it feedback, and on the basis of the feedback, you change the strengths of the connections. And the idea is that as the connections strengthen, the network gets better and better at pronouncing the words it's seen. And then, really, the test is to see how well it does on new words it's never seen before. So I'm going to give you a demonstration of what the network sounds like at the very beginning of training, at the very first pass through the database. What, is, what does the network actually sound like? Well, it sounds a little bit like babbling. And that's because the network, uh, the first thing it picks up is the distinction between vowel and consonant, but it can't, doesn't know what exactly what the sound should be for each of the vowels. And so it just babbles through until it finally gets to the point where uh, it sounds like this. And this took about a, a, a day of, of training, going over the training set over and over and over again. And here's the, here's the, the, uh, some of the, this, the text that we used. Uh, this is a transcription from a first grader. And you're going to see now what we came back the next day, what, what the network was doing. When we walk home from school, I walk home with two friends, and sometimes we can't run home from school now. Because Pretty good, you know, for a, a one day old uh, network. And, which just uh, actually astonished not just my lab, but it astonished all the experts, because of course they told me that this, they could never. We could never possibly solve this problem because the best linguists had looked at it and they had written books, literally books on English pronunciation and there were rules and lists of exceptions to the rules and then there were rules of the exceptions and you know it, it really didn't look like it was going to be an easy problem but for some reason a, a network with these weights could take into account both the regularities in English and also the irregularities in a, in a, a, similar, in a similar way. So this is something that uh, we're beginning to learn that some of the things that were difficult to program might be easier if we try to compute using neural networks instead of uh, digital uh, programming. Of course, we're doing all the simulations on a digital computer, right? But we're doing using the digital computer as a way of simulating the the uh, the, the network. Uh, it would be it could it, I will show you later that uh, our ultimate goal is to actually build physical devices that would run much faster and much more efficiently. Okay, I'll give you another example from some work in my lab uh, by Tony Bell about 10 years later. And this is a problem in blind source separation. So here's, it's called the cocktail party problem. Suppose you, you're sitting around, uh, uh, you're, you're uh, standing around and you're drinking a cocktail, talking to somebody, 
and around you are other people talking and your ears are getting bombarded not just with uh, the, the discussion from the person you're talking to but many many other people or there may be music playing in the background right how is it that you're able to distinguish the one person and listen and understand them uh, despite the background here uh, so that's uh, that makes that's a difficult problem but it's even more difficult when you're not told ahead of time whether the signals are coming from people or from music or from some biomedical measurements right they could be signals coming from anywhere and all you're given are a set of mixtures each one of these has a different weighting each of these sources will have a strong or weak link so each of the mixtures will give you a different combination but of the same sources so uh, Tony and I put together an algorithm that is a recipe for, again, changing the connection strengths here on the weights from the mixtures to the output. We, the, the sources here are invisible. We don't know where they are, what they are. But what we can do is change these weights. And the idea is to invert the mixing matrix so that on the output we can recover each source without any of the interference. It was thought when we first started that that might not be possible, but we showed under some mathematical conditions that not only was it possible, but it was extremely efficient. And, and now, in fact, this algorithm, uh, which is the InfoMax ICA algorithm, is, is in all the textbooks. So first, I'm going to give you a demonstration from a real recording with two microphones and two sources. First, the mixtures. So you get an idea of the complexity here. What? Okay, so there's two mixtures like that. One more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, so the music is a little bit nine, quieter. Okay, now after independent component analysis has to go over this a few times. In other words, it's an iterative algorithm, just like the training of the early, the network that I showed you earlier, the NetTalk network. And here's how it ends up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that was the, uh, the, the voice. So it works not just for two sources. It will work really well for 100 sources, or even 1,000 sources, way beyond human capability. What this illustrates is that if you have a problem that can be put into the form of a mathematical form, uh, like the uh, independent component analysis uh, problem, that if you had a learning algorithm that allowed you to learn through experience, uh, you know what the weights should be, then you could really uh, use it in many different for many different uh, problems. It's just a matter of being able to figure out what is the right what are the right uh, uh, algorithms that we should be using to change the weight. So networks are very, very powerful. That's what we learned in that first generation of, of, of networks that were very, very simple models of the brain and not very accurate in terms of the biological reality, but nonetheless had some of the basic principles of parallelity, of uh, learning, and the, especially the, the, the idea that it's going to be done in the form of changing the strengths of the connections. Now, I should say that. Um, one of the outcomes of this was a spin-off company called SoftMax, and we discover something in the lab. Uh, the really question is whether the marketplace uh, has a place for it. And um, the uh, Taewon Lee, who was a former postdoc, developed a two-microphone solution to the problem of how is it that if you have a headset, you're trying to talk to somebody, and there's, you're in a restaurant or you're in a noisy sports event, how is it that you can cancel out the noise? The person on the other end hears the noise uh, and it drowns out the, the actual speaker, right? So here's, the, there's the, where the, here's where the microphones are located. Uh, but with two microphones, it's possible to use ICA to separate out the background from the speaker and to cancel out the background. So this is very, very helpful, especially uh, it, you know, uh, the next generation of hearing aids will also have this embedded in it. Uh, it one of the problems, uh, if you have, if you're hard of hearing, is to uh, get rid of the background noise because that's very interfering. It's very difficult to to um, to separate that out. But with uh, 
a device like this, it should, uh, it should help quite a bit. Remember, it, it requires two microphones, so it may be that even better if you have three microphones. Okay, now, uh, the examples I've given you have been feed-forward networks. That is to say, the information is flowing from the input to the output. But we know in the brain, there are a lot of feedback connections, that the neurons that are receiving inputs also have feedback connections so that their information is able to circulate. And it really was very difficult to analyze these networks. They're very nonlinear. They're difficult to predict ahead of time what they'll do. And it really was a great insight that John Hopfield had, who is my PhD advisor, into being able to analyze a particular class of these networks called Hopfield networks now, in which the connection strengths between the model neurons were symmetric, so that if A was connected to B with a certain strength, B was connected back to A with the same strength. And he showed that under that special case, it's possible to analyze and understand completely what the network will do. It turns out that the network has stable states that it will be attracted to. So no matter where you start it, it will end up in one of these attractors, with a number of attractors roughly proportional to the number of neurons that you have. And this was thought to be a really important advance because it showed how nonlinearity could be used in a very powerful way to do something uh, similar to what the brain does, associative memory, to be able to, for example, hear somebody's voice and be able to recognize who that person is, or to be able to take a face and have a, a name attached to it, right? Those are all tasks that we take for granted. And it's a networks like this that can complete patterns that really set off a, of a lot of research into the capabilities of these recurrent networks. And it was about the same time that Jeffrey Hinton and I were working on another class of, of a similar class of networks, but ones that were probabilistic. Uh, John Hopfield's networks were binary, zero or one, uh, and they were deterministic in the sense that there was no noise. But in our networks, which we called Bolson machines, uh, we wanted instead to add noise. So we actually added noise so the network would fluctuate. Uh, it had inputs and outputs. And the, the key here, again, was how to get these uh, hidden units to be connected up so that they could solve even more difficult problems that couldn't be learned by a single layer of weights. Um, I'm not going to go into any of the mathematical details except to say that in order to solve this problem, we had to come up with a new state of the network, which we called the sleep state. Uh, and and uh, that is to say, uh, during the training phase, the inputs would be present and the outputs. But then, and we would collect statistics, these are correlations between units, but then in order to calibrate the network, what we do is to turn off the inputs and the outputs and just let the network free wheel. And the idea was that this is a little bit like going to sleep, where you're no longer bathed with sensory inputs and your motor system is uh, not working, paralyzed during REM sleep. And you collect statistics and you subtract them. So this is an interesting uh, mathematical necessity, which turned out to give us a, maybe a little bit of insight into one, why it is that we have to go to sleep every night. And in fact, uh, there's a lot of evidence now, growing evidence, that in fact there's plasticity occurring when you fall asleep that is reorganizing, recalibrating your brain circuits. Now, when we first uh, came up with this algorithm in the 1980s, Computers weren't very fast compared to the computers we have today. They're, they're about a million times faster now. And this algorithm is very slow. So we didn't make much progress back then. But Jeffrey has continued to work on it. And now he's been able to show that it's very competitive with, with the world's best pattern recognition systems. And here's this one example. This is recognizing handwritten digits, 0 through 9, on zip codes. And this is real data from real databases from the post office. Uh, so the idea is each one of these digits is presented to the network. Uh, these Bolton machines can have many layers, and so we, this one has one, two, three hidden layers. And at the very top, there are just ten neurons that have the labels on them, one, zero through nine. And the, the, the goal is to take all of these numbers here, these, these, uh, this, just the raw intensity of the pixels, uh, present them to the network, and then through this process of learning to be able to uh, ultimately label each one of the patterns, input patterns. Uh, now, up until a, a, a few years ago, the, the best algorithms that uh, were applied to this problem, including the backpropagation algorithm that we use, for example, for NetTalk and support vector machines, 
we're making errors on the order of 1.5%. And, and Jeff now has lowered that to 1.25. Now, you know, it may not sound like a lot, but if you think about it, the difference between this and this is percentage-wise is quite large because uh, this is uh, going from uh, it's being lowered by 0.15. It's about 10 percent. So it's uh, it's really uh, you know it looks like this is going to be very practical and it's probably going to be applied to many problems like speech recognition that will allow us to produce many, you know, much, much better uh, algorithms, much better performance on many practical problems that are important for us, for example, for being able to interact with each other in a natural way. We, we use language. But right now, if you want to use a computer, most of you are probably typing with an interface that's over 100 years old and it's very clunky, right? Wouldn't it be better if you just talk to your computer? Well, that's going to happen within the next within, I hope, the next five or ten years at least, we'll, be, we'll have the algorithms now and, and it, it's going to happen. Now I want to really uh, take the brain seriously. So uh, let's, let's look at behavior, because right now these little networks that we have are like little pieces of the brain. With, with the, a brain, we have to look at it as a system, not just as a single little piece. And if you take the brain apart, you discover that there is structure at many different spatial scales from the molecular all the way up to the entire central nervous system. That's eight orders of magnitude. And there's interesting structures at each one of them. I've already talked about the neurons and the connections between them. They're called synapses. But, uh, but these little networks themselves are connected up into spatial maps in the visual system, in the somatosensory system. And then these maps, in turn, are connected up uh, with each other in, in the form of uh, large-scale memory systems like uh, the, the hippocampus that is receiving information from all the sensory systems and is helping us to understand uh, uh, and form memories for events and uh, objects, specific objects. Well, um, let's go back to the bee and, and try to see if we can make some progress understanding how a bee can forage for food. Because if we could understand a few of the circuits in the bee, this might give us some insights into the human brain. After all, we also have to forage for food. And uh, you know, if we understood how the bee did it, it might help us understand how we do it. So <clears throat> if we look into the bee's brain, we find that there are, it's filled with these unique neurons that are one of a kind. It's not like our brain where we have you know, a billion cortical neurons, or if we have 100,000 neurons in, the, in a particular brain area, uh, bees get by with one neuron that may have the same function as all of the neurons in, you know, 100,000 neurons. And there's one in particular called Vomix-1. It was discovered by Martin Hammer and Randolph Menzel. Uh, they were recording from this neuron, and this is, uh, this is the cell body, the cross-section of the bee brain. And this is the axonal arborization. That's the output. So this is the input. This is the output. And what they noticed was that when they recorded from this neuron and they presented a drop of sucrose solution, a sweet solution, to the uh, olfactory, to the, uh, the, the proboscis, that it produced a very strong burst of action potentials. And it was known that this uh, neuron, when it fires, releases octopamine, which is a neurotransmitter, in all these different areas of, of the bee brain. This is the antenna lobe, which is important for olfaction. This is the uh, mushroom bodies, which are important for memory. And this little area here is an output area. So a sensory, a memory, and an output area are all getting bathed with octopamine. And what they were able to show was that, in fact, if you pair not sucrose, but with just the firing of the neuron with an odor that you could produce the same output, that the, the proboscis extension. You could condition the proboscis with an artificial stimulus that stands for the sugar solution. So this is a really uh, an important piece of circuitry in the bee brain because it may be important for the bee, how it makes a decision, uh, first of all, to remember something, and then finally to uh, help make decisions and uh, guide the bee to good flowers. Now, um, that was, at the time when it was first uh, announced, it wasn't quite clear what the circuit looked like, but uh, several postdocs in my lab at the time, Reed Montague and Peter Dayan, uh, in particular, were uh, very intrigued because of the fact that this looked as if it could implement, this one uh, neuron in the bee brain could implement 
uh, an algorithm that had been developed earlier by Rich Sutton and Andy Barto called the Temporal Difference Learning Algorithm. And, and the way that this algorithm works is it's really quite simple. The idea is that if you're um, visiting a yellow flower, uh, the, the strength of the connection allows you to predict how much sugar solution you should expect, how much uh, nutrients from the flower. Now you start out with zero, but then if there's a, a, a significant signal from the nectar, uh, you get more than you expect, so you increase the strength until it exactly balances what you expect. And when that happens, there's no output from this neuron. It only is, is, is giving you an output when you get more than expected or less than expected. That's what the temporal difference is all about, taking differences. Now, what we were able to show, though, is that if you include this algorithm together with a very simple decision-making system, that you could reproduce a lot of B behavior. In fact, uh, things like risk aversion, B prefers not to go to an uncertain source of food, it prefers a sure thing. Uh, it very accurately represents the probabilistic uh, variability that bees will uh, land with a certain probability. So uh, it explained an enormous amount about bees, but it also gave us a really interesting idea. What if this neuron, a single neuron in the bee brain, represented a population of neurons in your brain that might be having a similar function? Wouldn't that be uh, interesting? What kind of neurons would these be like? Well, uh, the uh, neurotransmitter octopamine is a cousin of another neurotransmitter called dopamine. And I'm going to skip over a little bit here. And the dopamine cells are in the brainstem and project very broadly and widely throughout the entire cortex and uh, basal ganglia, parts of the brain that are very important for memory and for d making decisions and taking actions. Not only that, but uh, if you uh, lose dopamine neurons, it's a medical condition. Uh, it leads to Parkinson's disease, which is uh, inability to initiate motion. Uh, you have uh, tremor. Uh, it has cognitive side effects. And one of them turns out to be anhedonia. Anhedonia is an absence of pleasure. You, you no longer take pleasure in anything, in food, in uh, going to a lecture, or thinking about something. It, it, the world is flat for you. It's, it's, you've lost, it's lost its, its, its spark. And, and, uh, and uh, every addictive drug, like cocaine, nicotine, they all work by uh, somehow enhancing the activity of dopamine blocking reuptake or causing release. So this is a very powerful set of neurons. These are neurons that are really important for motivation. And if they go awry, either too much or too little, it can really uh, uh, you know, take over your, your, your control of the rest of the brain. And it was in this context that Wolfram Schultz, a neurophysiologist recording from the dopamine neurons in a monkey brain, made an important discovery. He discovered that these neurons if we recorded from them during a task when the monkey was learning and getting reward, uh, orange juice in response to being able to pick the right choice, that, uh, these neur that the dopamine neurons were behaving exactly like that vomix one neuron in the B brain. It, it, looked as if, it looks as if the dopamine neurons are computing temporal differences. Uh, by the way, uh, Wolfram Schultz is shown here at uh, a meeting in Telluride sitting next to his friend, Wolfram is on the right. So, so we now, I think, uh, this is very generally accepted now, that uh, we have in our own brains a very highly conserved system that controls basic fundamental behaviors about, you know, appetitive behaviors, behaviors that are important for your survival. And we, we also are beginning to understand a little bit about what happens when these neurons go awry, and leading to many different types of, of, of diseases and impairments, like Parkinson's disease. Um, so finally, the last part of the talk, what I'd like to do is to switch gears and, and talk a little bit about uh, a, a, ch a shift that's occurred. Uh, for a long time, people have tried to build robots that put cars together. And, and these are very mechanical, and they don't look at all like humans, right? 
But there's a new class of robots that's coming out that do look a lot more like humans, and not just because of the nice uh, features of the face here, but it's because of their behaviors. These are social robots, and, and they've been designed to be able to interact with humans, not with uh, automobiles or you know, uh, industrial robots. Uh, now, uh, we have, uh, as, as Natasha mentioned, we have a uh, NSF-sponsored Temporal Dynamics of Learning Center in San Diego, which involves 10 institutions and 50 researchers and uh, s probably another 50 students working on this project. And one of the important uh, new directions that we're taking it is to try to integrate what we know about psychology of child development, uh, what we know about learning from neuroscientists who are studying the changes in the synaptic plasticity between neurons, uh, and also uh, machine learning, which is the area that I represent, uh, trying to build up uh, internal models within a, a model of a, a robot's brain now that would uh, have properties that re resemble those that occur in a child's brain during the process of education. The idea is that the way to create a, a social robot is the same way that we create humans through learning by experience in, the, in, in a, a structured environment. And I'm just going to give you one example of a particular project by one member of our group, Javier Movellan at UCSD. And this is a, a question he asked about uh, classrooms for preschoolers. This is a, a classroom where uh, toddlers who are 18 months old uh, are brought in, and, and they, they're, uh, they're going to be interacting with a social robot here called Ruby. And the question was whether or not you could get the interests of the kids. Can you attract their attention, and if you can, long enough, can you teach them something? Well, it was a, a really a shock for Javier to discover what the, that it was an environment that he just didn't expect, that the first thing that happened was that the kids would run over and grab the arms and try to pull them, and, and the next thing you know, uh, the robot had to be repaired. <laughs> okay, well, um, that's something that... Um, he, he, he figured out a, a, a way to solve that problem, not by making the arm stronger, but by programming the robot so that if the pressure on the arm exceeded a certain value, the robot would say, ouch. And of course, the kids immediately would look at it and say, hmm, what's going on here? Then they go back and start grabbing the arm again. Uh, but when he programmed the, the Ruby to start crying, then suddenly everything changed. Suddenly, the robot became a different creature, and, and then the, the little kids would come and try to hug it. Because this is, of course, a social signal that they use, that they communicate with each other. And so that's really the goal here, is to find out what are these social, a lot of them innate and built in, but what are these social conventions that little kids use to interact with each other? Now, this is a later version of Ruby, and now it's been programmed, and it, it is figured out uh, that time was incredibly important for the reaction time. If the robot didn't react within a second or two, the kids would lose interest. They would run off, or if it was too fast, they'd lose interest because it was too mechanical. But if they reacted in the same time window that other kids interacted with, the, with, with each other, then the, the robot can create a dialogue with the kid in terms of uh, playing games, shared attention. The child would look at something and point, and then the robot would look at it, and the children just loved doing that. They would do that for hours. And it was through this, these interactions that, uh, and, and the learning process now, this is a learning taking place, both in terms of the investigator learning about what it's like to be in the classroom, and the kids learning, uh, for example, through the screen here, the names of colors, that suddenly magic happened. Suddenly the kids accepted Ruby not just as a, a playmate, but as a, someone that they, they looked forward to coming in. And if Ruby had to be taken down because of, uh, it had to be reprogrammed, the, the, the kids would ask about Ruby. You know, is, is Ruby okay? Well, well, Ruby would be back tomorrow. So this, is, I think, is giving us a sense that as we as we create these devices, we really have to endow them with uh, natural human expressions 
the, the robot has to be able to recognize your expression. And now we actually have, with machine learning, we've, we've developed algorithms now that allow us to do that. These machines are going to interact with us on our own terms. Now finally, and that has to do with uh, making machines, um, we can't afford supercomputers to run these algorithms. We have to be able to build actual hardware that's going to be able to run things cheaply, efficiently, and in a way that is very lightweight from the point of view of power, right? And a technology is being developed right now. It was founded by Carver Mead, uh, who's a computer scientist at Caltech, who realized that the very same circuits that are in your digital computer could be run at very low voltages, at low power, in the analog mode. So instead of running it to the rail, zero, one, you can now look at the distance between zero and one and use that analog value to represent signals, just like neurons use analog values, the membrane potentials, right? Now, these chips also have to use digital signals to communicate with each other, and those are like action potentials. So we can begin to put these chips together in the same way, for example, your brain is put together in terms of local circuits in the cortex and long-range connections between them. Uh, for, th th and furthermore, uh, th they are very, very power uh, very low power uh, on the order of microwatts instead of, you know, uh, your laptop does is like closer to 40 or 50 watts. Uh, and it, 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 a tremendous amount of parallelism can be integrated uh, if we knew how to connect them up uh, in, in a way to solve these difficult problems. Now, this is going to happen someday. It's already happening, is that once these chips become um, commoditized, then they're going to have many, many applications. And I can, it's already happening that uh, certain chips are now being placed into human eyes. Uh, not these neuromorphic chips, but rather uh, digital chips as, as the very first step to stimulate the ganglion cells when the photoreceptors have degenerated. And, and, and it, uh, for retinal degeneration, uh, these are patients who are blind. And by implanting a chip, that is able to stimulate the optic nerves that go into the brain, it's possible to bring some sense of light back into their lives. And it's very, 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 if you've been blind all your life and suddenly you see what it's, what, you know, light, even though it's very low resolution, it's really uh, tremendously uh, important as, as a first step. And you can imagine that as these uh, implants become more efficient and better at mimicking the actual circuitry in the retina, that it, it would, should be possible in the near future, and my colleague E.J. Chichelnitsky is actually working on this right now, it should be possible to reproduce the actual f function of the retina and then to be able to give these people real sight. And this is really going to be like the bionic ear, but now the bionic eye. And it's within grasp. It's not a, this is not a science fiction. This is really going to happen, I hope, within our lifetime. So finally, let me just uh, speculate a little bit the last few minutes. Um, where have we been uh, as, uh, in terms of uh, science and technology? Well, if you look at the first half of the 20th century, these were, in the, were a period of great discovery in physics and in chemistry when the laws of quantum mechanics and relativity were discovered and, and turned into uh, technologies that we now take for granted, like this laser pointer, uh, computers. Right, that's all built, your cell phone, that's all built on physics in the first half of the 20th century. Well, what happened in the second half of the 20th century is just as momentous, if not more so, because it was in the early 50s that DNA was discovered by Watson and Crick. As fundamental a discovery as uh, the theory of quantum mechanics, but now for biology. And it's taken 50 years to, for that to play out, and we now know an enormous amount about how cells are organized and how DNA is replicated. And that's being turned into technologies. And now we can see biotech firms here and elsewhere taking advantage of that knowledge and, and using it to create not just new drugs, but new synthetic life forms. So this is an exciting period that we're living through. Well, let's look at what's going to happen in, in this century now. Um, what's the fundamental discovery that's going to power the next phase of science? And here, it's purely speculative. Here's my best guess. I think that we're just entering the age of information. Tremendous 
amount of information at your fingertips through the internet. Tremendous amount of information that's being, that's gushing out from all of the, the, the labs uh, that are churning out genomic sequences for all the species and for individuals. Soon your own genome will be worked out and we'll know how the, all the differences between uh, all of the humans and, and which ones are related to different diseases, which ones are related to different abilities. It's not going to be simple and it's going to be, but it's going to be fascinating to work it out because it's not just the genomes of people who are living, but we're going to see fossils of genes of people who lived long ago and we'll see that for all the species. What are the sciences where these discoveries are going to be made? Well, Certainly computer science is powering everything because without computers none of this would be possible. So there's an incredible amount of work that has to be done in computer science to make this data storage, retrieval, searches, that's all part of the discovery process that is going to take place. But ultimately it's when we understand our own brains that we'll finally really be able to understand how it is that nature gives us these great gifts that we have that we're, we will understand the principles that will allow us to build uh, not just chips but large systems that will allow us to interact with the information world in a much more efficient way. And, and, and finally there's going to be a hardware side of that, the nanoscience side, where uh, we're going to be able to shrink down the, the, uh, the sizes of the chips down to the levels of single molecules. Why is this important? It's because ultimately it's energy which is the rate limiting step. It's the energy, your brain works on about 20 watts compared to the, uh, you know, the, the gigawatts that uh, computers, uh, supercomputers are using. Uh, th that's not f feasible. It's thought that to go to the next level which is exascale computing, 10 to the 18th, it's a thousand times more than a a petaflop, which is what we have today, that the, the, the uh, power that's going to be required for that technology is going to be on the order of 120 megawatts. That's like a, a city, you know, the entire New York City subway only runs on 20 megawatts. Clearly that's not the right direction to be heading, because it's not sustainable in a green environment. We need to develop uh, a new, a much more powerful way of computing based on molecular uh, components. Nature has already been there. We know it's possible. But uh, it, for the first time, though, I think we'll be able to uh, manipulate matter with the same degree of, of, of power and fidelity that nature had invented long, long ago when uh, the first cells were, you know, the origin of, of life in the very first cells. Uh, that was the great discovery that has brought us all the way here tonight. So thank you very much for your attention and these are all the, the wonderful colleagues and mentors that I've had over the years and I very much appreciate all of you coming here tonight to hear my oration. Thank you. Terry's come a very long way to be with us tonight. We're very grateful for his oration and I have to say I love a man who can combine machine learning, weeping robots and doilies. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wonderful. What, a, what an exciting time. We are alive in that 2000 to 2050 period. We're here now in the thick of it. So in our lifetime, who knows where we're about to head. I'm, I'm, look, I've got goosebumps just thinking about it, so I'm thrilled. Now, Professor Graham Clark would, of course, love to be here at the oration that has his name at its t as its title, but unfortunately he's been infected with whooping cough. So he's in lockdown. We're not letting him out of his house. Um, and he can't be here tonight, and he sends his apologies. But we are videoing the event, so he'll get to see it all on tape. Instead, he's asked Professor Emeritus David Pennington to do the honours tonight and thank our orator. David Pennington has a distinguished career in medical research, medical education and health care. He was Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Melbourne. He was also a former long-standing Vice-Chancellor of that university. And thinking about the bionic eye that Terry spoke about, right now he's currently chairman of Bionic Vision Australia. He was former chairman of Cochlear, Cochlear Limited, um, and so he has a great passion for the themes tonight. Please welcome Professor Emeritus David Pennington. Well, thank you very much. It's a, 
real privilege to have an opportunity to thank our speaker tonight. Uh, we've had a remarkable presentation. The audience here is a group of people from very varied backgrounds. There are some who are thinking members of our community who are just interested to hear about science as it evolves. There are some who have a broad general understanding of perhaps what neuroscience might be about. There are some here who, who have careers committed in studying aspects of neuroscience uh, and people who are right in the middle of the computing revolution as it affects the issues that are being spoken to tonight. But to have a presentation from Jerry Januski of the kind that he's given us, covering that broad span of things is simply remarkable. He's a man who's made contributions in many aspects of understanding the functioning of the brain. Most in our community, or many in our community, are still lack back where Descartes was in the mid-1600s, saying that there are certain things that are subject to objective analysis and can be worked out logically, but a large part of the brain is quite different. It's a metaphysical thing which is quite separate from that uh, analysis of objective logic, and that gave us the concept of duality in human nature. And it's still true that many in our community feel threatened by the idea that the brain is an organ to be analyzed like the other organs of our body to be able to see the computer processes of networks that can mimic the way we handle so many issues in our lives. And Joe Januski has studied the issues of sleep, of dreaming, the processes of memory, how it's composed, and the processes by which uh, information is transmitted, partly when we're asleep into our prefrontal areas to, to test whether what we're thinking about really matches what we want. We don't have to speculate that there's a soul that is doing all of that in a quite different way, making the judgments for us. We are beginning to understand the way our brain handles all of these complex issues, and it's an exciting venture. And so much of the advances in science now are advances that bring together many different disciplines together to apply themselves to these complex problems. And Joe Januski is just a, a wonderful example of bringing all of those things together as we now explore this exciting threshold of discovery about what we are, how our minds work, and how we deal with the world around us. I'd like to ask you to join with me in a vote of thanks to Jerry for an outstanding lecture tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it's now, it's now my privilege to present to our orator uh, a memento of this occasion. We'll arrange to help you get it back to San Diego but it's uh, with great pleasure that I present you with the Graham Clark Oration Award. Wonderful, thank you so much. It was just a privilege to be here. What an amazing sculpture that is. It looks like a model of the cochlear implant. Um, thank you, Professor Emeritus David Pennington and especially to Professor uh, Terry Sainofsky, thank you. Welcome again to Australia. I know you're about to go hiking after some visits to the universities tomorrow. Um, so enjoy the hiking with your wife, uh, Dr Beatrice Gollum. I think you're here tonight too. Welcome to Australia. Um, and thank you, you can take a seat and relax. The 2010 Graham Clark Oration wouldn't be possible without its generous sponsors, including our venue hosts tonight. In fact, uh, so much is the support for this event and what it represents. There are 19 sponsors for this year's event. So can I draw your attention to the names of the institutions and publications and organisations and individuals involved in sponsoring an event like this? It's an immense effort uh, to put on an event like this and the dinner afterwards. So thank you. Let's give them a big round of applause along with Terry.
And with that, can I thank you as well for attending. Greatly appreciated. Look forward to seeing you at the next occasion. Thank you. Bye-bye.